a skeleton crew, but we're working. We're still working. We appreciate you being here. For those of you that are joining us virtually, we appreciate your presence as well. So glad that you have joined in with us. Hopefully you have been able to enjoy, uh, join in in the singing, join in in the praying, and now we're going to focus together on the message from the book of God. Amen. I want to invite you to Hebrews chapter 4. While you're turning there, I want to thank Brother Willie for reading our text this morning. I'm going to focus my attention on the first couple of verses just to set more of the stage in the direction as to where I am going. Uh, but we will be dealing with material that's found in those first 11 verses of Hebrews chapter 4. As you know, we were in the book of Hebrews last week, examining some thoughts from the Hebrew writer to try to gauge uh, where we are in life uh -huh. with where God wants us to be. Right. And we want to try to do that again. We want to try to align our steps somewhere. I heard that song, Order My Steps, yeah. in your word. We want to try to do that again for this morning. I want to thank our brother Patrick Stone for starting us off. Hebrews chapter 4, I have the New King James Version of the text. Now throughout this message, I'm going to dip into a couple of other translations uh, to emphasize more clearly uh, the message. But let me begin in the fourth chapter in the New King James Version at verse number 1. The book of God says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The Christians to whom this letter was originally written were under troubling times mm -hmm. and they were facing imminent Roman persecution. Mm -hmm. Public abuse, imprisonment, mm -hmm. and the general societal rejection of Christianity were combining to erode their faith. Mm -hmm. They had come to the point where they felt it would be safer, mm -hmm. more acceptable, if you will, to return to Judaistic beliefs. Mm -hmm. They knew that the Roman government did not frown upon Judaism, so long as there was no rebellion against Roman authority. Mm -hmm. They felt that if they were to return to that faith system and turn away from Jesus, mm -hmm. life would get better. Mm -hmm. And so the Hebrew writer, knowing their spirit, knowing where they were and knowing where they were heading, decided to pin a letter by the direction of the Holy Spirit to help them hang on to Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I think that this letter is a word of exhortation. It's not just mere encouragement, although it does include encouragement. It's also warning. Mm -hmm. It's a charge. It's, 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 it's a challenge. It's a push to keep on going forward. And they needed that, and I think we need that. Yeah, right. I think that's the kind of message that we need to hear even in 2021. Amen. You and I are dealing with the aftermath of a chaotic presidential election. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are facing the uncertainty yes. of a potential economic recession. We are in the throes of an unprecedented cultural revolution. All of these are good reasons for a word of exhortation, but in spite of all of that, I think there's a greater need for a word of exhortation. That need is to be aware of the satanic sleight of hand that deceives us into missing God's best, that defers us or deters us 
from reaching God's best. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that we can hear these words from this text together. I hope that we can benefit from the charge together. I want to just use, based on these words in this text, the message entering God's rest. Entering God's rest. Now, if you notice the reading, there is a reflection here on national Israel. The writer talks about how national Israel uh, was hard-hearted in the wilderness. And he talks about how national Israel therefore missed God's rest. But let's start with the question, what do you and I have in common with national Israel? We have some things in common with God's old covenant people. When we look at the New Testament, uh, we can find some things that teach us something about what we share in common with national Israel. You see, we can scripturally say that the church is the antitype of national Israel. The church is not an afterthought of God. It's not like God chose the Israel nation, the Israeli nation, and promised to bless them, and then when Jesus came, they rejected him, so God said, "Uh uh-oh, now what do I do? I guess I'll put together a church. That's not the plan of God. The church was always in the plan of God. God always had in mind that the church would be his true chosen people. And so the church then is really the type of which Israel uh, uh, was uh, the precursor. The church then is the antitype of national Israel. Paul wrote about this in the book of Galatians chapter number 6. Verses 15 and 16, he said, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. That's what the people are. That's what the church is, a new creation. Paul went on to say, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon, watch this now, the Israel of God. That's who we are. We are the Israel of God. Paul writes on in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 through 29. He says, for you are not true Jew because you were born Jewish uh, of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by God's spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God and not from people. What do we have in common with national Israel? We are God's chosen people by God's original design by which we compare with Israel. They were the type, but we are the antitype. Said in another way, we're the real thing. People who have changed heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. People that are not trying to follow, if you will, the letter of the law in the sense of tradition. But people that have been called to live a transformed life. That's who we are. That's what we have in common with Israel. But then there's something else. We are God's chosen people by grace. You know, Israel was God's chosen people by grace. The book of Deuteronomy reads like this. In chapter number 7, God said, for you are a holy people to the Lord. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. A special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord God did not choose you or set his love on you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep his covenant oath which he swore to your fathers. Why did God choose Israel? It wasn't because they were so great. It was because of his divine sovereign will. He chose them to be his chosen people. But why did God choose you? Why did God choose me? It wasn't that our reputation is stellar. We don't have anything that we can take to heaven and say, Lord, look at these credentials. You are so glad you chose me. I I know you're so happy. Some of 
of us go around with the testimony about how we found God. Let me remind you, you didn't find God. God found you. Jesus says to his disciples, you didn't chose me. Choose me. I chose you. Every one of us has been chosen by God, not based on our resume. But based on his love. Somebody says, well, I don't understand why God made that choice. Well, I don't understand it either. But I'm grateful to be a part of it. All I know is that the Bible teaches us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14 that we are called by the gospel. And that message when it's responded to with the right heart results in that person being a chosen person of God. And so we have in common with Israel, not only that we are God's chosen people, but that we are God's chosen people by grace. Let it never be forgotten that by grace you are saved. And the Bible says, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, but rather we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Every blessing, every benefit that we receive from God has no basis in our ability to earn it. And am I happy about that? Am I happy about that? There have been some dark corners in my life. There have been some dark deeds in my life. Thank God that those things did not stop God from reaching down to me and reaching down to you. And then there's something else that we have in common with Israel. Not only are we God's chosen people. Not only are we God's chosen people by grace, but also we can be the recipients of of God's gracious reward. Uh-huh. Amen. What is it, a gracious reward? It's a reward that you don't earn. Come on now. What is a gracious reward? It's when God gives you a reward, but he didn't have to. Uh-huh. Israel, they were recipients, or better said, could have been recipients uh-huh. of God's gracious reward, but you and I share that in common because we can receive the gracious reward, and this is where our text leads us in chapter 4. All right, all right. That gracious reward is rest. Yes, yes. Notice the writer said in verse 1, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest. We can have the gracious reward. What is it? It's rest. Yes, sir. But what does that mean? Oh, Bought a new bed not too long ago <laughs> because I wanted to have better rest. Yes, Damn, Got tired of turning in the mattress yeah. and finding a spot yeah. where I just caved in yeah. and then made the bed and you still, still saw the dip yeah. in the mattress. Yeah. I needed something better than that. Right. So reached out for another bed for better rest. Uh-huh. Some of you have been watching these sleep number commercials. Yeah. Even got Dak Prescott on there yeah. talking about getting rest. Uh-huh. But we need a different kind of rest yeah. than that type of thing. Uh-huh. So what is rest biblically defined? We need to first look at the contrast. We need to look at Israel in the wilderness. In the book of Numbers chapter 13 and verse number 1 through chapter 14 in the end of that chapter, we find the nation of Israel in the wilderness en route to the promised land. God had delivered them from Egyptian bondage and now they were trekking their way to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land that God promised Abraham, his ancestors to have, the land that the people were marching toward. They were right at the precipice of being able to go over into the land and as they were preparing to go into the land, Moses sent spies over to check out the land and to see what was going on. Well, you should know that the book of Numbers is a time of transition from one wilderness generation to another. The first generation, the people that came out of Egyptian bondage would end up being doomed to judgment and they would be replaced by the second generation which was called 
to faithfulness. Mm -hmm. The story of Numbers serves as a pattern of sorts and calls every new generation to be one that believes and behaves yes. in order to receive God's very best. Uh -huh. Well, those people, the spies that went over into the promised land came back and they said, oh, the, 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 the people over there, the land is great. Everything is wonderful, but... Yes. Uh -huh. There's some big giants over there. Yeah, Those guys are so big they make us look like grasshoppers. Right. And we feel like grasshoppers. Uh -huh. And they look at us as grasshoppers. And if we get over there, they'll just squash us on out. Uh -huh. We can't go over into the land. Right. Two men stood up boldly. Yeah. Joshua and Caleb and said, wait a minute now. Yes, sir. Didn't God promise us that land? Yes, sir. Isn't this the same God that we saw whip up on the Egyptians? Yes, sir. Isn't this the same God that we saw drown them in the Red Sea? Yes, sir. Isn't this the same God that gave us bread from heaven, water from a rock? Yes. And when we got tired of that, he still gave us quality. Isn't it the same God? If he could change nature by the movement of his hand, certainly he can wipe out these individuals and let us come into that land. But the people, and you know how the crowd of people can be when they're wet blankets. The people were a wet blanket to the hearts of the masses. Moses was turned on by the people. Yeah. They said, Moses, you're the one brought us out here. Yeah. It's amazing. They always jump on Moses. They didn't want to try to jump on God. <laughs> they jumped on Moses. Moses, you brought us out here. You and that rascal brother of yours. We need to kill both of you and pick a leader to take us back to Egypt yeah. where we were free. Uh -uh, wait a minute. Hold the record. You weren't free in Egypt. No, you were slaves. Man. And now you're saying you want to go back there? It's amazing how our memory changes yes, yes. about a situation that really wasn't good, but because what we're looking for is more challenging, we fall back. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. oh, it was a whole lot better in Egypt? No, it wasn't. Man, they were beating the skin off you yes, and giving you some meat to allow you to have to come back the next day and get the skin beat off of you again. Oh, and you're saying that was better? And so God got tired of those people. Right. And as a result of God getting tired of those people, the record says that God said, I will not let any of these folks that were adults coming out of Egypt, I won't let any of them enter into the promised land. All right. All right. I'm going to have their flesh rot right here in the wilderness. That's what this text is referencing. And so God's message through the book of Numbers and now through the Hebrew writer is these individuals having been a witness and a beneficiary of God's miraculous works of deliverance turned their back on God, rebelled against Moses, and they, God said, shall never enter into my rest. But then God turned around through the Hebrew writer and he said, yet there remains a rest available. Look at him again in chapter 4. He says that promise remains of entering his rest. Well, that makes good, good feel for us if we know what it is. The term rest. In this text of scripture and throughout other texts of scripture, particularly Acts chapter 7 and verse 49, has the idea of where somebody lives. Right. Where somebody lives. When we go back <laughs> to our places of work, for those of us that are working from home, when we go back to our places of work, I don't know about you, but at a certain time of day, I'm ready to get out the joint. I'm ready to go. I'm like Fred Flintstone. Some of you remember the Flintstones? He's on that dinosaur, moving the rocks, and then the whistle blows, and he goes, yabba dabba do. Slide down the back of the dinosaur, into his car, feet on it, he gone. I'm like that when it comes time to get out. I'm not one of these people that loves the job so much I want to stay there for the rest of my life. Yeah. There's more things to do in life yeah. than to be there working nine to five trying to make a living. Yeah. And so I'm ready to go and I want to go home. And even when I go on vacation, when it's time to get home, 
Drag those suitcases up the step. Open that stuff up. Put things away. Kick my shoes off. Get off the rest of a traveling clothes. Take a shower. Bam. On the couch, yes, in the bed, yeah. in my own refrigerator, on, getting a drink anytime I want one. On, I love being home. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, that word rest has the concept of where you live. Right. But notice the term rest is modified in the text by God's rest. Oh, yeah. It's the place where God lives. Oh, yeah. It's the place where God lives. In the Old Testament, the Old Covenant people thought that rest was the promised land. Uh -huh. And I can understand that. Come on. Because they were a nomadic people. Yeah, yeah. They were living from place to place. Yeah. They didn't have a place of their own. Right. They were living in a desert atmosphere. Mm -hmm. They were just traveling from place to place to place. And the promised land in their mind was a picture of an oasis where you would have the land, as the words go, flowing with milk and honey. Yeah. It was an agrarian culture. Uh -huh. Now you don't have to worry about trying to scrape two bones together to eat. Yeah. Now you can plant seed All right. and you can grow crops uh -huh. and you can have water yeah. and you can have a bounty for harvest yeah. and you can build a home yeah. and you can have a place that you can rest yeah. and eat. And that is what was in their mind, a place where nobody would bother you anymore. And when they thought of God's rest, that's what they had in mind. All right. All right. And God had that in mind for them, but there was something deeper that God had in mind. Now the Hebrew writer understands rest not to be the promised land in the sense of something down here. He understands rest to be that heavenly dwelling place of God that is appointed for anybody who wants to live for the Lord and stay there in eternity. That's the rest that is still available. That's the rest that this text is talking about. I'm talking about entering into God's rest. You and I have got to get a greater appreciation for what that means. You see in verses 6 through 10 of Hebrews chapter 4, this text lets us know that rest is still available. The writer tells us that that generation delivered from Egyptian bondage didn't get into the promised land. But then he tells us that even those who did still haven't entered God's rest. You see, Joshua, Caleb, and the new generation were able to go into the promised land. Moses even couldn't go. But the rest of them did go. And even when they got there, it wasn't exactly the rest they needed. Because when they got there and enjoyed some years of prosperity, even to get to that point, they had to fight. Even to get to that point, they still had to worry about intruders coming in. The king of Egypt wanted to come in. Oh, yeah. The king of Syria, Assyria, Babylon, all of them were looking at the Fertile Crescent, which is where this was, to come, come in and take over. Because once you get established in a beautiful place, other folks want it. That's why you got locks on your door. At home. Uh -huh. Locks on your money. <laughs> Others want what you want, what you got. And so even those who went over into the land didn't fully enjoy everything that they thought they were going to enjoy. And the Hebrew writer makes it very plain. If you would please notice the text with me in Hebrews chapter number four, the Bible lets us know that even if Joshua could have given them rest, uh -huh. Then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. God did not only have in mind and did not primarily have in mind that the rest he would provide would be something on this earth. And even today, entering God's rest is not merely about having something nice in this life. It's much more valuable than that. The rest that God has is when you and I can come into his house, so to speak, and kick our shoes up, so to speak, like God did. Have you ever thought about the creation text? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Remember that? 
on the first day such and such a thing and the morning and evening was the first day on the second day such and such a thing and the morning and evening was second day same with the third day same with the fourth day same with the fifth day and then you finally get to the point and on the seventh day God rested but you never read where the seventh day came to an end. Come on, man. It never came to an end. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On the seventh day, so to speak, God said, <laughs> Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very good. But you never hear that that day came to an end. And if you can follow me there, now you know what God is asking us, or rather offering to us. I want you to come in the house and enjoy my rest, because it will never stop. Oh, I've had some days in life where it becomes such a beautiful experience. You don't want the day to end. Man, this was a good day. Good food. Yeah. Good enjoyment. Uh -huh. Watch some TV. Dallas finally won. <laughs> Went around the park. Yeah. Did like the old rascal song, some of you might remember. It's a beautiful morning. Yeah. Yeah. Guess I'll go outside for a walk. Yes, sir. It's a wonderful day. Yes, sir. And you hate to see it end. Okay. Because you know the next day. Come on, man. There's some stuff coming yes, sir. Yes, sir. that you don't want to have a part of. Yeah, on the seventh day, God rested, and the Bible never said anything about the closure of the seventh day. So what the Hebrew writer is talking about is a day that is unending. It is the day of God's rest. It's not talking about observing the Sabbath. No, sir. No, sir. It's talking about resting with God. Amen. He says there remains a rest for God's people. Yes. If you want it, God says, I invite you to it. Yes, but then as we look a little further in this text, we need to see that rest must be something we desire. Amen. Israel wanted rest from her nomadic desert dwelling. And if I had been among the Israeli people, I would have wanted rest too. Mm -hmm. Who wants to have to travel from hole to hole to hole? Right. From desert to desert to desert. Right. And to be worried about raiders and invaders every time. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants that kind of life. And so they wanted that kind of rest. But then when we fast forward and we look in Hebrews around the year 65 AD, these Christians wanted rest too. They wanted rest because of their desperate existence. Right. You and I don't know about that. Nobody stands at the church building waiting to arrest us Amen. because we claim Christ. Amen. Yeah. Nobody stops us and, 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 and tries to take our freedom mm -hmm. because we love Christ. There are other people in other parts of the world where Christianity is followed, and that is the experience. Thank God at this point that hasn't been the experience here. And yet and still, those people were facing that, and they wanted rest. Right. Those first century saints, saints, they really wanted rest. We're tired of being arrested. We're tired of being convicted falsely. We're tired of even losing our lives. We need rest. And the Hebrew writer wrote to them and said, God offers rest. Amen. But I find it amazingly interesting that the writer doesn't focus his message on a this world solution uh -huh. to their problems. Right. I, I find that fascinating. He knew what they were going through. But when he talked about rest, he wrote nothing about God's giving them rest by changing out the Roman emperors or the Roman government. All right. That's not what he wrote about. He wrote nothing about God giving them rest by changing their unjustified prison sentences. That's not what he wrote about. Nor did he refer to rest as the betterment of the economy and the guarantee of better jobs and health benefits. Come on, come on. That's not what he wrote about. Right. Now that would have been good news to them <laughs> and rest to them, but that's not how he defined it. All right, all right. I say all that to say this. Sometimes you and I, we get rest mixed up 
with blissful life in America. Mm, come on, say that. Yes, sir. Sometimes we get Christianity mixed up on, Mike. with a nice, enjoyable, Snoopy dance life come on, come on. where everything goes well oh, yeah. and we help other people and we listen to the music and everything's going well in life and we gracefully grow old and we get to a point where now we fold our hands and we say goodbye to everybody and they sing nice songs and off we go to the hands of Jesus. Mm -hmm. America's messed up a lot of our thinking about Christianity. Yes, sir. And don't you go calling Trump. <laughs> I'm not talking about America being this, that, or the other. I'm just stating the fact yes. that what the Hebrew writer talks about in terms of rest isn't focused on a this world thing. And what we need to think about when we think of entering God's rest, we need to think about God saying something to us about how we view our lives down here. Listen, people, while having a nice job, having a nice neighborhood, nice house to live in, having nice health benefits, and having a nice family, and loving children, and loving spouses, and parents, and all that stuff. Having all that is good. It does give us a sense of rest and peace. But while all of these things are important and should have their place in the exercise of our prayer life, God's hand in our lives is for a deeper purpose than that. God has in mind more than our earthly enjoyment. And may I say that God often has in mind that we not have earthly enjoyment. Listen. Don't let your life be defined by, measured by, or preoccupied with mere matters of time. Mm -hmm. Mm. Matters of time are important. Wouldn't you say so? Yes, matters of time are important to me. Mm -hmm. But I can't allow my life to be preoccupied with matters of time because I ain't got long to stay here. Right, mm -hmm. One of these days, right. matters of time give way to matters of eternity. Yes, and so the Hebrew writer says there's a rest for God's people. I know you are in devastating times and I'm telling you God has rest for you and I want you to have that rest but I don't want you to be preoccupied with Jesus coming in in a Superman cape and changing your earthly circumstances. Uh -huh. He may not do that but he still offers you rest. Amen. Rest is knowing that I'm going home with Jesus, Amen. just the same. Amen. Yes, sir. Lastly, let me share with you from this text, who, who will enter into God's rest? Mm. Who will enter into God's rest? I don't know about you, but uh, there's a sense of assurance that no matter what's happening down here, as mm -hmm. long as my life is in tune with the Lord, right. it's going to be all right. Yes, sir. Eventually, it's going to be all right. Yes, sir. Who shall enter into God's rest? Well, I think the answer is simple. You see, when we look at this backdrop where the Hebrew writer looks back at the people of the Old Testament, you know, out of the 600,000 men, 600,000 men, let alone women and children, mm -hmm. out of the 600,000 men who left Egypt, only two, Amen. only two yes, sir. got into the promised land. Right. That's amazing. A critical thing to remember is that rest is offered on an individual basis. Mm. Who gets the rest? Those who choose God. Amen. Critical thing to remember about following Jesus is the individual nature of making that choice. Yes, sir. Let me share with you something from Jesus. And this is from the, mes the message paraphrase. I, I think I, I wanted to use it for this sharing with you because I think it's so clear. This is coming from Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse, verse number 34. Listen to Jesus. Don't think that I've come to make life cozy. All right. I've come to cut. All right. Make a sharp knife cut between son and father. Right. Daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law. Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. All right. All right. 
Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. Yeah. If you prefer father or mother over me, you do not deserve me. If you prefer a son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. Uh -huh. Come on. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. Isn't that amazing? That's what Jesus says. It's a choice not only of an individual nature, but it's a choice of obedience. Anything and everything that God offers us is only attainable by faith and obedience. You and I will never have God's best without those two things. The text says that these individuals couldn't enter God's rest because they received the promises of God, but they didn't combine them with faith. Amen. Faith is not simply I have mental assent, I believe and I accept it. No, it's I obey. Amen. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. Uh -huh. You remember that song, don't you? Yes, and it goes on to say, with the glory shows in our way, while we do his good will, he abides with us still, and to all who trust and obey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh yes, I want God's best, but God won't give me his best unless I trust and I obey. And the more that I put off obedience, the more that I put off trust, the more I delay God's best in my life. Amen. I want God's best. And the more I put off trusting and obeying, the more I delay that coming. And the more I delay it coming, the greater likelihood that I'll never get it. Mm -hmm. These people did not get rest because they forfeited that rest. Right. Right. And so lastly, it's a promise that we must catch on to. I want to end with this quotation, this reading rather, from the fourth chapter of Hebrews verses 9 through 11. As we talk about entering the God's rest, remember, it is not a time-bound thing. It doesn't mean that they're not time-bound benefits. There are time-bound benefits. But it's deeper than that. It's something that's available to all who trust and obey. And so the writer says, so there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God, as the people of Israel did, we will fail. Amen. Lord, I'm tired of playing church. I'm tired of going through.